Good afternoon. Welcome to the RSES Manufacturer Webinar Series. I am Lori Casales, RSES Journal's publisher and editor. I would like to welcome everyone to today's session on Refrigeration 101, Main Components and its Principles, presented by John Prawl. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Imbraco for sponsoring today's webinar. Their generous support is how we keep these webinars free for members, and we value their shared commitment to educating HVACR professionals. John's presentation will last approximately 45 minutes, and afterward there will be a Q&A session. Please submit any questions you may have throughout John's presentation using the GoToWebinar dialog box on the right-hand side of your screen. I'll field those questions and then ask them aloud to John. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing at your convenience as soon as possible. Now I would like to introduce uh, John Prawl. Hi, welcome to the Refrigeration 101 uh, webinar covering basic refrigeration and the four major components. In today's webinar, we're first of all going to define what, a refri what refrigeration is, define a refrigerant, cover what makes up a good refrigerant, review some of the pH diagrams and saturated PT tables, and understand how that can help you in sizing components and designing your system, review the cycle, and review the four major components in the system. First of all, we're going to cover refrigeration. Refrigeration is simply the process of moving heat from one location to another location. The work of heat transport is traditionally driven by mechanical work, but it can also be driven by heat, magnetism, electricity, or other means. The concept is basically to move heat from an undesirable location to a location where it is less troublesome. Heat can be measured um, in BTUs, which is British thermal units, for those of you who are used to the imperial system, or in kilocalories for those who are used to the metric system. A BTU is defined as the energy required to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit or in metric one gram of water one degree Celsius equals one kilocalorie. You can only move heat from a warmer location to a colder location. There is no such thing as creating cold and mechanical refrigeration will require the use of a refrigerant. So let's go into a little more detail around what heat is. There's two types of heat. Sensible heat. This is heat that you can feel and measure and it involves a temperature change. Latent heat is, involves a change in state of the fluid and you will see no measurable temperature change. And we're going to cover later on why these two different types of heat are important when designing a refrigeration system. Now let's cover refrigerants. A refrigerant is simply a fluid that is used in a heat pump or a refrigeration cycle. In most cycles, it's going to undergo a phase transition from a liquid to a gas or vapor and back again. There are several properties that make up what we would consider an ideal refrigerant. First, it would have a low boiling point. You want that boiling point to be a little bit lower than the temperature that you're trying to achieve in your cabinet. A high heat of vaporization, a moderate You want it to be safe. That would be free from toxicity and it would not be flammable. And you want no ozone depletion potential, mainly because that's outlawed and it's bad for the atmosphere, and a minimal GWP. 
which is the global warming potential of the gas. And again, this impacts our atmosphere. Also, you need to pay attention to the application that the refrigerant is being used in. Um, one that's suitable for one application may not be suitable for another application. So let's go into some GWP values. The definition of GWP is defined as the global warming potential of one pound of CO2. So one pound of CO2 equals one. Current commonly used refrigerants like R404A are close to 4,000 GWP per pound of refrigerant and 134A which is 1,430. Recent legislation from the EPA is going to be banning the use of those refrigerants by 2020 because of these high GWPs. One thing to consider is uh, R290 which has a GWP of 3.3 and R600, which has a GWP of 20. They have very low values compared to the current HFC refrigerants being used. So let's get into some refrigerant characteristics. This chart shows what uh, A class B has a high toxicity. One through three rates the flammability of the refrigerant. So the current HFCs are classified as A1 type refrigerants. As you increase the flammability, that number increases. So R290 and R600 are considered A3 type refrigerants. And there's a new refrigerant category coming out called A2Ls, which are low toxicity refrigerants that have a low flammability propagation, lower than A2 but greater than A1. R600A and R290 are A3 and ammonia in H3 is B, B2 type and you can see the GWP factors associated with them. The natural refrigerants do have a lower GWP value than the HFC types and NH3 has a zero. So when we talk about the flammability of the refrigerants we need to understand what that really means in the practical world. So for R600 and R290 there is a lower flammability limit this means that if the concentration of the refrigerant or of this gas mixed with air is too low, you cannot ignite the refrigerant. As well, when the concentration is too high, there's not enough oxygen in the mix and it will not burn. And then, of course, you have the minimum ignition temperature, which is around 460, 470 degrees Celsius. And then you can take a look at the practical safety limit, which tells you how many kilograms in an occupied space do you need for it to be considered safe or not safe? So in this case, these refrigerants practical safety limit is about 8 grams per meter cubed. So um, if you have a 5 meter by 3 by 3 meter room, which is about 45 cubic meters, theoretically you're safe to charge that system up to uh, 360 grams of refrigerant. But current IEC standards limit you to 150 grams uh, without any kind of special jurisdiction required. Um, there are certain uh, jurisdictions which will allow you to get uh, special permits based on the type of occupants in the room and the volume of the room uh, to exceed these charges, but uh, that requires some special permitting to do that. The point is that when you keep the charge limit down to 150 grams, you're looking at a fairly safe system. Now, critical point is the point where you cannot condense the refrigerant based on a temperature and pressure. So, by having a low critical point, 
um, you end up with a refrigerant that runs the risk of not being able to condense under current or under normal atmospheric conditions. And this is one of the challenges with um, uh, CO2. Uh, the critical point is right around 80 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, where the you cannot, no matter what pressure you have the system under, it will not condense. And you take a look, R600 and R290 typically fall in line with uh, the current gases that we're using today, like R404A and R134A. And what's also interesting is that they have a much lower density at this critical point. And we'll get to how that will help us later on. And then we want to take a look at the working pressure uh, based on the conditions at 25 degrees ambient, which is about 70 degrees or so Fahrenheit. Um, you'll see that uh, in a low temperature application, R600 and in a medium temper temperature application, R600 will be pulling a light vacuum and its discharge pressure is relatively low compared to other refrigerants. R290 has very similar properties to the R R22 um, in low temp and medium temp applications. And uh, R134A, which is a commonly used refrigerant for medium temp applications and household refrigerators, also has pretty low working pressures. And then you'll see that R404A has somewhat higher operating pressures than these other gases. So what that means for us is that when you are running um, these lower pressure gases, you end up with less wear and tear on the compressor. So you'll typically get a longer working life out of the compressor. And you should see a more efficient operation of the compressor as well, because it's having to do less work to compress the gas. And then a third benefit is reduced noise, because this work, this extra work, creates more vibration and more noise in the system, more discharge pulsations. So now let's hit the basic cycle. We'll start at point one being the compressor, where the compressor will take a low pressure vapor, apply work to the system, and raise that to a high pressure hot vapor. This high pressure hot vapor will enter the condenser where ambient air is blown over it, or in some cases water is cascaded against it to uh, reduce, and the idea is that you reduce the pressure um, I'm sorry, you reduce the temperature while maintaining a constant pressure throughout this process. At the outlet of the condenser, you will get a liquid refrigerant that is generally a few degrees above the ambient condition, at which point you will enter the expansion device, which reduces the pressure of this liquid. At the exit of the expansion device, you will get some flashing of the, of the liquid into vapor and liquid as well, now at a low pressure, at which point you'll enter the evaporator and the remainder of that liquid will boil away at constant pressure and then re-enter the compressor. And this boiling of the liquid in the evaporator is what gives you your cooling capacity. So if you look at it on a pH diagram over here, here's the compressor applying work and raising the pressure where we enter the condenser in a constant pressure process and reduce our temperature, enter our expansion device, drop pressure, then we enter our evaporator, again a constant pressure process where we change phase and eventually raise temperature. On a proper pH diagram, The V lines here mean you have a constant volume of your, uh, of your liquid, or sorry, of your vapor. X is constant or is your entropy line, and T is your temperature line. Along the horizontal axis is the enthalpy of the refrigerant, and the vertex is the pressure of your refrigerant. So under this curve, 
is what we call our two-phase region. And in this region, the refrigerant exists in both a liquid and a vapor state. As you move towards the right, the right side of it is considered your saturated vapor line. So as soon as that line, or right at that line, it's 100% saturated vapor. As you go to the right of it, it will become a superheated vapor. As you move to the left, the mixture, the ratio of liquid and vapor will proceed. liquid line, at which point you become 100% liquid. And anything past that becomes what we would call a subcooled liquid. So the point is, we have a state change. In So why does this matter? When you take a look at a saturated PT table, what you're to is your liquid enthalpy and your vapor enthalpy. Now you'll notice that the change in enthalpy as you increase the temperature or decrease the temperature per degree is still fairly limited. In the case of this is R290, if you move from 1 degree Celsius to 2 degrees Celsius, you only get about three kilojoules or two and a half kilojoules per kilogram. And same thing with the vapor, you get about a little over one kilojoule per kilogram. Now when you change state, you would subtract the vapor or the liquid from the vapor. And that change in state provides you with around 370 kilojoules per kilogram. So this is where most of the energy from your system, which is gonna provide your cooling effect or in the case of condensing, the heat of rejection takes place is from this change in state. The actual temperature change of the refrigerant has a very limited impact on your overall energy that you receive from the system, whether it be from cooling or from discharging heat. So again, let's go take a look at the compressor side of the system and understand what this impact is. So here, the compressor is adding work to the system. We are taking electrical energy to convert to mechanical work to raise the pressure. So this low pressure and relatively low temperature it can be anywhere from typically 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It's now raised to a very high pressure, high temperature vapor by the time it reaches the end here. And this could be anywhere from 160 degrees to 200 degrees. At which point, we'll enter the condenser again. And that condenser is going to de-superheat the vapor. So we're going to get rid of sensible heat until we hit the saturated liquid line, or saturated vapor line. Once we hit that saturated vapor line, it's just going to start seeing a change in state. So you would not notice so much of a temperature change inside that area or that the refrigerant up until you hit the saturated liquid line. Now if you continue on past here, you would consent you to subcool the liquid. And we'll talk about that later and why that's important. So what does this mean for us? As you raise your condensing temperature, as your line moves from here up to here, you end up creating more work for the compressor because you now have a higher compression ratio. So you're trying to raise a low pressure to an even higher pressure. So if you have a smaller condenser, it drives the system to have more work. Well, the ancillary effect is that now you hit the saturated liquid line at a much higher point on our curve. So when you go to expand that liquid now, when you drop down, you're at a higher point on the enthalpy line. 
So your cooling capacity, your overall cooling capacity has now reduced. So this is the, the real key here, the takeaway is if you have a if you if you aren't don't have enough condensing surface because you're trying to reduce material cost, you can impact the cooling capacity of your system. And what what you end up having to do is throw a bigger compressor at the system to get that cooling capacity back. Whereas if you oversize the condenser some or increase the size to take advantage of it to reduce your condensing temperature, you can actually use a smaller compressor. So it's a cost trade-off here that you need to balance. What costs you more, more compressor or more condenser? And then at the same time, what type of condenser you use, whether you use a microchannel, which gives you more, more heat of rejection in a smaller volume, or you shrink the tubes of your condenser to do the same effect. Now there's good reasons for having a small condenser as well. It might be you have no space to work with. And if you do that, you just need to be aware that you're impacting your cooling capacity as well. And this effect is magnified greatly as the evaporator temperature of your system decreases. So low temperature systems are much heavier, much greater, have a much greater impact on this than a medium temperature system would. Other things to think about with high condensing temperatures is that you could have um, higher discharge temperatures. This could lead to premature wear of the components, um, burnt oil, and then you end up getting higher superheats as well, which just cause a re have reduced the efficiency of your system and give you no real system benefit. And of course, your power consumption increases. As you create more work for the compressor, its energy consumption will increase. Let's talk a little bit about subcooling now. So if we subcool the system, we move past the saturated liquid line, and your sensible, you will be able to measure a sensible temperature change now. So you would have, say, 10 degrees of subcooling on your system. Now what ends up happening is as you hit your expansion device now and you drop down, you end up with a higher quality liquid coming out of the expansion device. This then gives you a greater cooling capacity in your system. So your net refrigeration effect per unit mass increases and you get a capacity increase with your system So there would be a material cost to consider um, when you do this. And of course you get better performance from your expansion device as well. Now our expansion device simply reduces or takes that uh, high pressure gas and reduces the pressure. It could be a, a simple thing like a capillary tube or a thermostatic expansion valve. Um, and all it does is just restrict the refrigerant flow to reduce the pressure. Moving on to the evaporator. The evaporation process is a constant pressure process that involves the change in state again. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this high quality liquid vapor mixture and we're going to blow the air from your cooled space where you're storing the food over the heat exchanger. This causes this warm air or warmer than you want it to be air causes the refrigerant to boil in your evaporator. And by the time the refrigerant leaves the evaporator, it should be fully boiled. And this gives you your net refrigeration effect. Basically, the enthalpy state at the beginning versus the enthalpy state at the end is your net refrigeration effect. 
things to think about with the evaporator. This component can have the largest impact on your compressor capacity. So if you design a system with a high TD, um, meaning that you have a relatively low evaporator temperature and a, to, to achieve your, um, your cabinet temperature, uh, what ends up happening is that your, your compressor capacity has to be greater to offset this difference. Um, and the higher temperature the vapor, the higher pressure your vapor is going to be. So basically the higher this evaporator temperature is, the more capacity you'll have for a, a fixed compressor displacement. So this is why you'll see that the same compressor running at higher evaporator temperatures moves a higher mass flow than the compressor at a lower evaporator temperature. Now, the higher the evaporator temperature, the lower the compression ratio because you're having to raise the pressure less when going through the compressor, which gives you less work per pound of refrigerant to compress. However, this is going to be offset by your increased mass flow because you're going to be moving a higher volume of refrigerant with a fixed displacement compressor. So, typically, the capacity of your compressor will increase about 8.2% per degree C and your power increases by 2.1 degree, degrees per degree C. Takeaway is the closer you're able to keep your evaporator temperature to your target cabinet temperature, the more efficient your system will be. The greater the TD, meaning the lower your evaporator temperature is for what, the, for what your cabinet tar target cabinet temperature is, the less efficient your system is going to be. So again, it's a cost play. If you increase the size of your evaporator to reduce that TD, it costs you more material, or you pay for it with a larger compressor. Moving into superheat. Superheat is simply when you cross over the saturated vapor line and continue to move on at a constant pressure. There are two types of that does actually increase your net refrigeration effect inside that evaporator. When you have superheat outside of your evaporator, such as in your suction line, you're not taking advantage of it in, uh, to help cool your product. Unless, of course, you're using it as a liquid to suction heat exchanger um, or as a, in the purpose of keeping liquid from entering the compressor. Because with the superheated vapor, it helps you guarantee that you won't have liquid return to the compressor because you cannot compress a liquid. Another thing to consider is that the higher your superheat, the higher your discharge temperature will be in the compressor. So you want to try and minimize it where possible. Um, ideally, you don't want to have a 90 degree Fahrenheit superheat, but sometimes it's unavoidable, particularly with outdoor or kitchen applications. Um, but you want to have enough to make sure you're not sending liquid back. So the takeaway here is that with the impacts from changing system conditions is that the overall compressor conform performance and the overall cycle efficiency are directly impacted by our operating conditions. With that, we're going to open it up to questions. Okay, John, thank you. We do have a couple questions. Um, the first one is, um, I just want to make sure you can hear me. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. The first one is, uh, how does the compression ratio and heat of compression of R290 compare to R404A? Okay. I can actually uh, go back to that slide. Let me get there more efficiently.
Okay. So R404A, um, basically your compression ratio at low temperature, um, in this case, this is uh, assuming a minus 20 Fahrenheit and a plus 20 Fahrenheit in this column operating condition. So at minus 20, um, the compression ratio for 404A is going to be, in this condition, would be 18.17 divided by 1.65, which is mm, about, uh, off the top of my head, somewhere between 12 to 1, and R290 is significantly lower at about 9 to 9.5 to 1. What was the second half of that question? Um, it just asked how compression ratio and heat of compression of 290 compared to 404A. No second part. Okay. Okay. okay we have another one, and it reads, uh, is there anywhere in a refrigeration cycle where a control device could be used, and when is it practical? Oh, you can use control devices. Uh, I'm assuming that the, the question is about whether to use a uh, solenoid, or an electronic expansion valve. Um, a lot of times you'll see uh, solenoid valves used in the liquid line um, to prevent discharge or uh, the, condens the condensed liquid from entering the evaporator in the off cycle. Um, and what that helps do is increase the off time of the compressor uh, because you don't have that heat migrating to your evaporator and then warming up your product. Um, that's one thing. Um, of course, you want to make sure that solenoid valve opens before the compressor kicks on because you'll have basically a deadhead situation otherwise. Um, and then there's there's some discussion about using electronic expansion valves. Um, I they're they're common in larger size systems, but they're they're able to maintain a tighter control on your evaporator pressure versus uh, the typical mechanical or a capillary tube. Okay. Um, for anybody who's just entered the webinar, we're um, presently asking questions. So if you have any, go ahead and uh, enter them now. Um, John, I have a really long one, um, which might be better suited offline, but you're an engineer, so should I just go ahead and read it? Well, go ahead and try. Okay. I have a two and a half ton AC unit, upflow forced air furnace, R22, three ton TXV, 957 CFM, ESP of six to seven, I'm assuming that's inch water column, 75 PSIG suction with a 215 PSIG discharge. What should my superheat be for the system? He also provides additional information if you want me to continue. Yeah, that's a question that needs to be taken offline. That's not, um, that's, that's going to be, a, that's, a, that's an exercise. Also needs to be, uh, the manufacturer of that equipment should be consulted as well. Okay. Uh, let's see, where else? Um, bear with me as I work through these. Earlier, you talked about having special permits for refrigeration circuits that have more than 150 grams of R290. What special permits are those? For example, a machine in a kitchen. Yeah, the um, it's for uh, self-contained refrigeration. Um, I don't know anybody that's actually pursuing that. Uh, they're just limiting the the charge to 150 grams. Um, but when it comes to um, uh, uh, like an air conditioner uh, using some sort of hydrocarbon or a large system that's remote, there are some uh, published rules with the IEC around what type of person is going to be in that room, um, such as if it's a uh, if it's a room that's locked and no one's allowed entry or if only employees of that occupied space are going to be entering it, then there's another different charge. Or if it's free to anyone in the public entering it, there's a separate charge limit. Um, and, and then you come under whatever local jurisdiction in the area will allow. 
So it's quite complicated, and um, it's 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 very very difficult to work those permits out. You kind of have to get involved with the local fire marshal, or whatever local codes exist, IEC, UL to to do that kind of thing. Um, really, it's best to just follow the 150 gram limit for a self-contained system for now. Um, and I don't know of anybody that's really making systems that would require that type of jurisdiction at this point. Okay. Another question we have is, can you tell me again when a suction line heat exchanger would be necessary? Um, yeah, that's actually a really good question because the, it, there's a, um, you would want to do it for efficiency sake, right? Because it would subcool your liquid and superheat your vapor. Um, so you can increase the efficiency of your system just by doing that alone. Um, but you, the, the idea to use it is if you have a, um, a system without some sort of suction accumulator um, where you have a risk of liquid return to the compressor, it's a really good idea to do that to ensure that you have sufficient superheat going to the compressor. Okay, I have another one. It says, please discuss the enthalpy change from flash gas, gas excuse me, and please show it on the pH chart. Sure thing. Actually, this will be good enough. So the... Um, the, the thing with flash gas is you don't actually get a benefit, um, an enthalpy benefit from it. Um, there, there is obviously some refrigeration effect from it, but you don't get to take advantage of it because it's not in your refrigerated space. But essentially what's happening is that you have a, typically you would find that about 20 to 30 percent of your liquid let me go to the, actually the one that shows the uh, subcooled region because it's a more realistic condition for the real world. So what happens is you drop down here. Um, you won't actually realize this flash gas effect. Um, it gets lost, essentially. So you can't take advantage of that in your system. So the, the, the more subcooled your liquid or the, the better quality you have coming out of your expansion device, um, gives you the most advantage when it comes to the net cooling capacity of the system. Okay. I am not seeing any more questions, but I did just let everybody know that they could ask them again. If anybody has any questions, please go ahead and ask them now. Uh, here is a new one. Uh, New York City refused to grant a permit for R290 at a methane recovery site uh, at the Arthur Kill dump site. So they had to go with R22, 28,000. Uh, it looks like a comment. Big D and B screw compressors. Um, that's a comment. I apologize. No problem. Um, John, if you also want to let people know, uh, do you have a website people can go to as well? Yes. Okay. We sure do. Um, we have a, a website here, um, sort of devoted to natural refrigerants, and there's also an email link in there. Should you have questions, that will direct um, these questions to somebody here that can help out. Um, but that website is naturalrefrigerants.info. Um, as well as you can go to Embraco's website at embraco.com if you have further questions. That helps. I have a question. I believe he's asking how to size a capacitor in the field. Does that make sense to you? Um, yeah, the question makes sense. Um, it's it's a little off topic, but the the best thing to do is get the compressor spec. Um, that you have out there, and use the capacitor that is uh, that capacitor size that's on the compressor spec. Um, because if you don't use that size, you will not get proper performance out of that compressor. Because that 
that start capacitor um, provides a certain amount of additional torque that's required to get the compressor up to speed and you can't oversize it or undersize it. It needs to match what the spec says. Okay, and a few more are coming in. Um, do you see R290 being a suitable replacement for R404 or R134 for efficiency and cooling capacity? Yeah, actually, um, uh, R290 R, R has significantly higher efficiency um, than R404A and 134A. Um, could be on the magnitude of about... Um, 30% over 134A and 15 to 25% over 404A. Um, from a capacity standpoint, um, it is significantly higher capacity per unit displacement than 134A and just slightly lower than R404A per unit capacity. So what that means is um, you're you would use a much smaller displacement compressor um, when replacing a 134A compressor and a slightly larger displacement would be needed to uh, replace the R404A model. Okay, another question came in. What is the problem with low superheat? There's no problem with low superheat. Uh, so long as you can ensure that there's not liquid going back into the compressor. Okay. Any thoughts on R290 replacing 404A in the comfort cooling market? If I understand correctly, the Asian market is using R290 for window and mini splits. Yeah, that's, um, that's going to be dependent upon, um, first of all, uh, on, on many splits, it definitely has a use. Um, unfortunately, it's not a market I'm too well versed in, um, but it, it makes sense to me to use R290 uh, in these type of applications. I'm not sure what the Asian charge limits are. Um, I was under the impression that typically you need about 500 grams of refrigerant to make those systems work. Uh, I could be slightly off on that number, but uh, if, if the charge limits do get increased, it, it will make perfect sense. Um, I don't think we'll ever see any kind of uh, central, you know, like a typical house in the U.S. where we have central air ever converting to it, um, just because the, there's a, we require a little too much refrigerant that then codes would allow, um, particularly if it's going to be occupied by, um, by families and things like that. Um, that's just, of course, this is all supposition on my part, right? Um, I would like to think that we could be used in the mini splits here. Okay. Um, if mass flow remains constant with an increase in subcooling, how does the evaporator transfer the heat? Did I lose you? No, um, oh, I was trying good. to understand the, the question. Okay. Um, basically, the effectiveness of the evaporator increases as well. Because um, what ooh, it, it's you end up getting more capacity out of the system. I I kind of want to. Um, Whoever's asking that question, I'd like to have a discussion with them to, to understand what they're trying to get at and maybe uh, cover some of that. Okay, I'll mark that one for you to uh, discuss offline. Great, thanks. And the next question we have, Europe has a market for R290. Some refrigerators and freezers have been sold there. Do you see Europe's regulations influencing the U.S. market? They already have. Um, for uh, self-contained type equipment, the market has pretty much completely switched over, um, and they're banning uh, 134. Well, they're basically banning anything over a GWP of 2,500 
by the year 2020, and anything over a GWP of 150 by uh, 2022. Uh, in the case of self-contained refrigeration, um, the U.S. Uh, came up with its own law that just passed in July uh, from the EPA that's going to ban R404A and R134A from self-contained refrigerants uh, by 2020. So we're a little more aggressive in some cases than Europe, um, but we have some other SNAP approved options that are um, higher GWP than what Europe will allow. Okay. Uh, this is kind of, you know, your opinion. If you want to answer it, that would be fine. Um, back in the day, there were only a handful of refrigerants to cover any type of unit. Do you think we will ever get back to that point? <laughs> Don't we all wish? <laughs> if only ammonia didn't kill people. <laughs> Let's see. That's about all I can say. On That's that. all you're going to say. I, I understand. Um, let's see. We have about uh, 14 more minutes. If anybody uh, just entering wants to ask uh, John a question, feel free to do it now. I'll kind of hang out for a minute here before I wrap everything up. Uh, somebody did ask um, how to get a question to you offline, and just so that person is aware, I will be sending the questions uh, to John after the webinar. So um, he will have your complete question and your email address, so we'll be able to contact you direct after um, the presentation. Might not be today, but he will. Yep, and then they can also go to this natural refrigerants.info site and um, uh, send the question through there as well. Good point. I, I made you promise that. <laughs> <laughs> you will answer these questions. <laughs> yes. Okay, well that um, looks to be it. I am going to go ahead and um, I, we do have a few people asking about why we're using metric specs. I, do, I don't know if you want to explain that or not, John. I'm sorry. Um, uh, my company is headquartered in Brazil, and most of it, most of the business we do is in the metric world, and that's what I got from them. Um, uh, I'm going to see if I can get the presentation converted into uh, English units. I, I apologize for that. All right, we do have another question now. Um, what is the highest BT rating that R290 can attain? Well, it can theoretically attain any BTU rating. Um, it's just a matter of realistically what we're seeing um, to to meet the charge limits is what I'm what I'm understanding the question is really trying to get at. Um, so, uh, with 150 gram um, in either a medium temp or a low temperature application, um, we're seeing that you can you can get up to about three quarter horsepower. Um, so in low temp, it's about uh, 25 or 2800 BTUs, and in medium temp, about 45 to 4600. We have seen some applications that have gotten up to 5000 BTUs with 150 grams, and that's assuming air cooled and a, and a, and a normal um, condensing temperature. If you uh, do a water cooled loop um, where you're condensing at, say, 60 or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you can get significantly higher than that uh, capacity-wise. Okay, a few more are coming in now, uh, so I'm just going to keep going. Uh, if the mass flow rate increases, will the BTU rate increase? Absolutely. And that's the point. You, uh, the higher your mass flow, the more BTUs you're getting, and that's the benefit. Okay, that was a fast answer. <laughs> oh, um, so everybody knows as well, you can also send questions uh, via email to naturalrefrigerants at imbraco.com, um, and they will field your questions as well. 
Uh, let's see. Can you tell us how to measure subcooling? That seems a little yeah, longer uh, than here. <laughs> no, that's actually a real. It's it's um, it's easy to describe, very difficult to do necessarily in practice. Um, so what you have to know is what your condensing pressure is. Find what that pressure corresponds to on a pressure temperature table for the refrigerant, and then measure what your liquid temperature is. So that difference between what the condensing, the saturated condensing pressure is on the pressure temperature table versus your actual liquid line is what your subcooling is. Um, so if you do not have a um, ability to measure your condensing pressure, you really don't have a way of measuring your subcooling, unfortunately. Okay. Um, a, a question, in split residential applications, we are just seeing how the retrofitting away from R22 to 407C. When will natural refrigerants enter this area of industry in the U.S.? Um, unfortunately, I don't really know. Um, that's actually a different market than what we serve here. Um, but um, I'm actually curious as to what refrigerant is going to actually be used in that application because I'm not sure that R290 is necessarily going to be used in North America. Um, well, probably the best place to start would be maybe consulting some of these manufacturers of these split systems to see where they're going, um, see what they're publishing in their, their trade publications or at the, uh, the trade shows and things like that. That'll probably be the best indicator of where they're going. Okay. So maybe you'll understand this. It's not... Uh asked as a question, but it says there's a push to accelerate R290 and bypass HFOs, and then a question mark. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, good, it's a good question to try and understand because, um, well, R290 is already a viable solution, right? The EPA has it SNAP approved. Um, it's available. There's products that support it. Um, HFOs are still just coming to the market or are still early in testing, and SNAP approvals aren't necessarily there for them. Um, and they're, they, these are going to be these lightly flammable refrigerants that we were, I was talking about would be called an A2L. Um, so right now it's still uh, exploration related to those refrigerants. Um, I know we are testing them to understand their behavior in the compressor, um, but they're not there's no products yet supporting them in the U.S. Um, there is one um, refrigerant that's being used in the automotive industry, um, R1234YF. That is one of these HFOs, um, but it's it's pretty much got a limited application right now um, in any type of uh, non-automotive application. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, another one is, what are the symptoms of a fractionated refrigerant? Um, well, basically the system is not going to be operating correctly. Um, all of your, uh, if you look at a PT chart, all the values you would be seeing for a given pressure wouldn't match it. Um, Basically, it's it's just it's not going to operate correctly. Um, so you go to measure your suction pressure or your discharge pressure, and you try and cross it on a PT chart, and it just won't match. It'll be it'll be wrong. It's probably the first indicator that something's happened. Okay, one more question. Um, so, what is the highest mass flow rate a compressor can make? Can a compressor get an extremely high mass flow rate to get a high BTU rating? That's um, an interesting question. Basically, it's going to have to do with, um, uh, let's talk fixed displacement, right, because that's where the discussion is easiest. Um, it comes down to uh, what temperature can the compressor handle? What currents can the motor handle? Um, 
and go from there. So really the, the, the key answer is you need to stay within the compressor's published envelope. Um, so uh, if you look at any kind of compressor data sheet, it's going to have a minimum condensing temperature, a maximum condensing temperature, and then minimum and maximum evaporator temperatures. Um, so your, your maximum mass flow is going to be whatever the highest evaporator temperature that the compressor will handle um, and the lowest condensing temperature that the compressor will handle. And that will tell you what a compressor's maximum mass flow is. Um, and that's, that's determined by several things. First of all, what can the valves handle? If the mass flow gets too great, you'll fracture the valves um, because you'll be uh, plastically deforming them. Um, and the motor currents also. Um, the overload in the compressor is sized to, uh, to limit current to a certain value so that the windings don't get too hot. And if your mass flow gets too high, you could theoretically get to a, um, a high current situation that would, could damage the motor windings, and that's why we trip the overload to protect them. Okay, I think that's uh, about all we have time for. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap up the webinar here. Okay, thank you everyone for attending this webinar. And again, thanks, John, for taking time to present the topic. And of course, to Umbraco uh, for sponsoring the webinar. For those of you who would like to view the presentation at a later date, you can do so in the next few days in the members only section of rses.org, which I will show you how to get to right now. So you go to www.rses.org, enter your username and password and click login. Then you're going to select the My RSES homepage underneath your name. Uh, the upcoming webinars are here, but if you select this webinars page, the archive sessions are going to be below. So as soon as we get this recorded, we will add this one as well. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me uh, at webinars at rses.org. Again, that's webinars at rses.org. Thank you again, everyone. I hope you enjoy the presentation and have a great night. This webinar is now concluded.